of planet Earth. What's up? My name is Afik Abdul Hamid and I am an aspiring astrophysicist. This video is the first in what I hope to be a long series of videos about my journey to remove that word aspiring to a point one day that I can say that I am an astrophysicist, a person that spends his or her days thinking about stars, planets, and galaxies, and getting paid cash money for it. I want to make a video series talking about my journey into astrophysics, which is something that I'm passionate about. As far as I can remember, for as long as 10 years now, I've had this idea that perhaps one day I may be able to carve out an existence, a life, and a career in space sciences. I want to talk about the things that I learn, my experiences, the obstacles that I undergo, and the insight that I gain in my journey from here to achieving that goal. Because I realize after having started myself on this path officially that one day someone has to be accountable for what's happened on that journey, and that person is me. So this series of podcast-like videos is sort of like a diary of accountability that I don't mind sharing with the world. Now, Julius Caesar wrote an easily digestible account of his conquest in Gaul, so I reckon I should start a diary of my conquest of the stars, as self-aggrandizing as that may sound. Like, comment, and subscribe if you want to follow me on this journey, and I hope to give a good tell of it. So let's begin. My name is Afik Abdul Hamid, and for the longest time, I have referred to myself as Son of Terra 92 and fashioned myself as a communicator of science. Now I've begun to walk the talk in, a, in an attempt to become a scientist and astrophysicist. And this is my story. The last year has been weird. So I'm from Malaysia, a very sunny and humid country in Southeast Asia. I graduated with a degree in electronics engineering and microwave communications. I had chosen that major a long time ago out of six other majors at multimedia universities, such as nanotechnology, electrical engineering, and pure electronics, because I thought that it would be the closest that I would get to picking up radio astronomy on a later date sometime in the future. Now, that was a decision that I made about a decade ago when I was 19, going on 20. I'm 27 now and soon to be 28 in less than a month. I remember sitting in a classroom when I was a teenager and thinking, wouldn't it be cool to work for SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and spend my days sitting out in an open field, listening to the static of the cosmos in the hopes that some intelligent, conscious beings would say hello and make their existence known through their radio transmission. I think Jodie Foster playing the role of Dr. Arroway in the movie Contact has a lot to do with my motivation. Contact was a movie based on some fiction written by Carl Sagan about humanity's first contact with extraterrestrials. It was to science like what Top Gun was to the Navy, an incredible piece of marketing and a recruitment tool. Now, why radio astronomy? First of all, what is radio astronomy? Is that like an astronomer with a radio show or something? Well, this show is meant to be sort of like a podcast, sort of like that like a radio, radio astronomy show. My voice right now is being disassembled into many tiny little pieces and sent across the ether on wavefront modulations and reassembled on the other side, almost like magic, so that you can tune in to a vital piece of information that I'd like to share with you. And that's more or less what it's all about. And the universe is doing that too, sending information across the ether on wave fronts to get to us, to get to planet Earth. And radio astronomy is just astronomy, but in radio and microwave frequencies within the microwave domain of the electromagnetic spectrum. If you go out at night and look up at the night sky, you see the moon, the planets, and the stars. During the day, you see the sun, which is also a star. If you're lucky and there isn't much light pollution at night, you may catch a glimpse of the Milky Way, and that is our galaxy, our little island of stars in the universe. All of that, everything that you can see at night comprises just a tiny fraction of the light that bathes our universe. 
Now, light is a wave and a particle all the same, which is pretty weird, but we won't talk about that much. But light as a wave is modeled as a traveling electric and magnetic fields that are perpendicular to each other and that exist at different wavelengths. Depending on their wavelengths, light manifests in different ways. The light that we can see has wavelengths of 400 to 700 nanometers. And that's all that our eyes can see. All the known colors and visuals of the world distinguishable by the human eye falls within that range. And it's a very small range. But light waves can get scrunched up into shorter wavelengths. Shorter wavelengths mean higher frequency. And there you have the ultraviolet, UV, X-rays and gamma rays. Ah, Hulk smash. And light can also get stretched out onto longer wavelengths to infrared and microwaves and radio waves. Now you can't see any of these scrunched up or stretched out manifestations of light. Uh, they're invisible to the naked human eye, but unmistakably they are there traveling across the universe and across the sky, crossing the vast distances of the cosmos to reach us. It's these long wavelengths of light that is of interest to radio astronomers for a lot of interesting reasons. Because of the long wavelength, the light goes straight through our atmosphere, so we can build telescopes on the ground to detect them. Our atmosphere forms a shield to the high frequency waves like X-rays and gamma rays. That's why X-ray and gamma ray telescopes, they're all in space. Radio telescopes are not like the telescopes that Galileo or Hubble use. They're not made of tubes and lenses. They are made of parabolic dishes and Yagi antennas like the ones you have to catch TV signals. The cool thing about radio astronomy is that you can do it when the sun is up. There's this thing called the radio window between one centimeter and 10 meters of wavelength that allow radio waves to pass through our atmosphere from space. Which means you can do observations in radio frequencies to quote Kanye West and Kendrick Lamar all day, all day. As long as your source is in the sky, you can absorb and collect data using radio telescopes. So far, I've only been to one radio telescope that is the one owned by the school that I currently go to for my postgraduate studies, Auckland University of Technology, AUT. It's a 30 meter dish called the Warkworth Radio Astronomical Observatory, located in the sleepy town of Warkworth, north of Auckland. It was once a satellite Earth ground station. Now, if you've ever seen pictures of deep space nebula taken by the Spitzer and Hubble Space Telescope, you may notice some fuzzy dark patches on the image as if there was something wrong with the picture. Maybe there's something wrong with the telescope because out of nowhere you see these black patches that obscure all the stars behind it. Or if you've ever looked at the Milky Way and noticed the dark spots that speckle the main band, it's actually because of the same thing responsible for these two effects. And let me tell you folks, let me tell you, I'm getting my Donald Trump finger gestures out now, three words, cosmic dust clouds. And these big clumps of interstellar dust scatter optical light and block our line of sight. But radio waves go right through these clouds of dust because their wavelengths, the wavelength of radio waves are much longer than the length of the dust particles. So the universe is transparent to radio waves. We can see past the dust clouds revealing ever more distant galaxies, quasars, blazars, and pulsars. That coupled with the fact that the radio continuum is a few billion times wider in length than the thin sliver of the optical continuum means that we are receiving so much more information from the cosmos in radio frequencies. But that comes at a price coping, a price that I will talk about further down the line in this series, so do stay tuned if you want to find out. I'm still discovering it for myself. So it's a journey of discovery for the both of us. Now, there's a lot to talk about in radio astronomy and astronomy in general. There is an entire universe to explore. So I don't want to begin a deep dive here. Astrophysicists work in a broad range of the electromagnetic spectrum to study a wide variety of things from pulsars and quasars to the formation of protostars in the outer galaxy supermassive black holes and exoplanets. Oh my. 
I could spend an entire episode talking about one or the other in particular, but this story is a personal voyage. It's an account of what I've learned and what I've been thinking about and the questions that I'm asking. So what have I been learning ever since coming here to Auckland? Like I said, the last year has been pretty weird for me. I landed in Auckland, New Zealand on the 24th of February, 2019 to begin a postgraduate, a master's in science degree with the School of Engineering, Computer and Mathematical Sciences, ECMS. Call it nerd school if you want. I didn't come here for AUT. I came here for the Institute of Radio Astronomy and Space Research, which is a pretty baller name for an institute. It's like, bam, in your face, we do radio astronomy and space. After beseeching with the powers that be, that is my parents, whom I love to Alpha Centauri and back, shouts out mom and dad, I was finally given my chance to begin on this journey that I had waited on for so long to be a part of, to learn astronomy and to one day become a radio astronomer. And that journey began for me on the 24th of February, 2019, when I hopped off the plane at AKL with a dream and a cardigan. The program that I'm doing right now is called the MCIS, the Masters in Computer and Information Science. It's a two-year program with 120 points coursework in the first year and 120 points thesis in the second. I'm in the middle of that journey right now, so I figure it's a good opportunity to take a step back and start this retrospect. And what's happened is that I've spent the last 10 months learning mostly computer science, actually. And that's why I say the past year has been kind of weird and kind of exciting at the same time. I did eight courses totaling 120 credit hours before the summer break. And I quite like this structure. It gave me some time to acclimatize and get into the rhythm of postgraduate studies before embarking on the meat of the research experience. I actually want to talk about the courses that I took and that will be the remainder of this episode. Give you the listener an imagining of what you would go through if you ever thought of doing a postgrad in radio astronomy with Auckland University of Technology. And that's a very niche thing to do, actually. Or if you've ever thought of continuing your studies in New Zealand, of all places, this is a description of one possible route. And there are many possible routes out there. This is a science channel, so I would like to spend my time talking about science things. Then we'll end with some of my final thoughts on the matter. So my first semester lasted from the end of February to mid-June. I took four courses. One of them is STAT 805, Computational Mathematics and Statistics. This course was taught by a serious, badass professor that I highly respect. The guy went to the same school as Isaac freaking Newton, Trinity freaking College freaking Cambridge. He's got a distaste for zombies, a mad hat for statistical analysis, and treads softly in the shadow of Professor Ronald Fisher, who actually introduced the Iris Flower dataset as an example of discriminant analysis. The Iris Flower dataset is the dataset, the example that every machine learning implementation cuts its teeth on and is prototyped on for tutorials. It's always the Iris dataset. The man is a beast and I'm considered lucky to have learned under him. His name is Robin Hankin and he drilled in the whole class the meaning of p-value. In science, p-value is used to falsify a null hypothesis. Suppose someone comes up to you with a ridiculous claim. How do we verify whether it's true or false? You use a p-value, that is, the probability given that the null is true of seeing the observation or an observation more extreme. Take, for example, the existence of extraterrestrials, aliens. You begin with a null hypothesis that aliens do not exist. The lower your p-value, the more scrutiny you objectively put this null hypothesis under. After all, such a claim would require the greatest of scrutiny, right? Now, after you've collected all of your data, observed the universe on all of its wavelengths and looked at every star system, your science machine, aka statistical model, then objectively churns out a p-value that is hopefully this really, really low number. 
And if that value is below a certain threshold called alpha, then you can decide to discard your null hypothesis in favor of a more suitable one. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the very crux of the scientific method. That is how we interrogate nature. The lower the p-value, the more falsifiable your null hypothesis becomes. If you want me to believe your claim, then you better bring me a small p-value, mate. I also learned a bunch of statistical concepts like the Poisson and chi-square distributions, maximum likelihood estimation, Bayesian inference, linear and logistic regression, all the stuff that would come in handy when interpreting data and the world. Statistics can form a worldview, and it's a pretty handy way to look at the world. A solid understanding of statistics can prevent you from getting swindled by snake oil salesmen and pseudoscientists. Speaking of snakes, did you guys see that Rick and Morty season five finale? <laughs> right. I also took this paper, ESE807, Digital Signal Processing, because radio astronomy is just space DSP, right? This course took me back to my engineering days where I got a refresher on my Fourier theory, which is one of the most beautiful theories in all of science. Long story short, you can reconstruct any information signal in the universe in terms of its constituent frequency harmonics using Fourier theory and Fourier transform. A Fourier transform is all about circles. It's a theory of circles. It's just circles going around circles, going around other circles at different frequency harmonics. And you can use it to draw images, which is pretty amazing. Of course, the application in astronomy is vast as well. If you want to convert any signal from the time domain into the frequency domain, you would use a Fourier transform. And depending on the parameters of that transform, determines the resolution quality of the output and the computational requirement of the transform. Now, the fast Fourier transform is really interesting. It's pretty much everywhere in science and engineering. Algorithm of the year, everyone. Clap, clap. It's one of those algorithms that stands the test of time. And that's because the original discrete Fourier transform or DFT for big data, long sequences is really impractical. So you overcome this by factorizing the DFT matrix into simpler parts. And by performing separate transform operations, you reduce the complexity from O n squared to O n log n. It's sort of like divide and conquer. Anyway, the tutor for this course had the habit of dressing like a member of Taking Back Sunday, rocking the plaid flannel t-shirts and black converse for like every class. I <laughs> kid, he's really cool. Dr. Anthony works for the data processing part of the Square Kilometer Array, or SKA for short. Half his research output is committed to the SKA, and I'll probably do an entire episode on the SKA further down the road. Surprise, surprise, it's something kind of awesome. My first astronomy paper was called Advanced Topics in Astronomy and Astrophysics, ASTR 800, where I was exposed to the forefront of current astrophysical research and a preview of the work that I will be involved with in the next two years. I met my radio astronomy supervisor, Dr. Willem, who is an expert in pulsar astronomy. Pulsars will be a subject matter that I will talk a lot about in my following entries to this series. Pulsars, neutron stars, gravitational waves, and the interstellar medium, they're all connected. Well, to me at least, so stay tuned for that. There's a lot to talk about, so I will try to divide them into smaller episodes moving forward to give focus on each thing and explore them individually. I did a data mining and machine learning paper, Comp 809. I know that there are a lot of courses in machine learning out there, DataCamp, Udemy to Siraj Raval. They all offer content on machine learning online, but I guess at the end of the day, it takes a human being telling it to you in your face, in class, to actually get it, eh? Some people learn better that way. Machine learning is all the rage these days, but what is it really about? I can conclude now that machine learning, despite what the name may imply, is not AI. AI is AI. Machine learning is more like programming meets statistics, and 
People like to throw around the words knowledge discovery, and that's the practice of gaining insight from data using various algorithms. Naive Bayes, Decision Trees, Support Vector Machines, KNN, K-Means, and the ever-popular Neural Network, also known as the Multilayer Perceptron. Interesting thing that I've read into sci-fi, uh, Isaac Asimov, who was a scientist and a science fiction author around the time of the 1950s, the golden age of science fiction, predicted that the robots of the future will be powered by this thing called a positronic brain. And then I learned that neural networks were also known as the multi-layer perceptron. Yeah, that's pretty, that's quite an interesting and uncanny connection, isn't it? But anyway, all these algorithms, these things, they're just tools of the data mining trade. The big assignment for data mining that I had to do was the highlight of the first semester. I had to apply unsupervised machine learning using Cajonan self-organizing maps to spatially cluster earthquake data and then piping the output to a decision tree to predict the path of propagation of earthquake aftershocks to try to figure out where the next major disaster would be. It was pretty awesome. I have fond memories of comparing the output of various different algorithms and plotting data. I was beginning to feel like data science was my thing, even though everyone and their mom is getting into data science these days. Python's where it's at. You can do almost anything with it. <laughs> the data set we had to work on came from the 2010 Darfield earthquake, and the results that I got revealed that the aftershocks were propagating in the southwest direction towards the city of Christchurch from the epicenter in Darfield. So the prediction was quite on point because a year later in 2011, there was the Christchurch earthquake and that really messed things up. But hindsight is 2020, right? Speaking of 2020, happy new year's guys. If you are tuning into this on some time around release day, semester one ended in June, I had a three week break. I went to Piha beach and the Coromandel peninsula, which was great, but it was in the middle of winter. So I was freezing my ass off. Semester two started in July and ended recently in November 5th of 2019. I took a research methods paper called Comp 811 with a radio astronomy topic. I evaluated the dynamic spectra of millisecond pulsar PSR 1937 plus 21. Those are actually coordinates, by the way, from baseband data gathered from the legendary Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. That's like one of my bucket list places to visit one day. It was in a bunch of movies and it was used in 1974 to transmit an interstellar radio message to the globular cluster M13, which is 22,000 light years away. So expect a reply from intelligent aliens in 22,000 years. Pulsar dynamic spectra represent an imaging of the turbulence caused by the interstellar medium. And pulsars are good for a great many things. And one of them is to probe the movement of the magnetized plasma that fills the space between the stars. And I'm taking this topic as my thesis topic next year. I used a supercomputer in Australia called Allstar to crunch my data. It turns out a vital skill astronomers need to have in this day and age is bash scripting on Linux machines. My majoring right now is pretty much computational astrophysics. Not observational, not theoretical, but computational. Now, I took this paper called Nature Inspired Computing, Comp 815, and I can't lie, I was really hyped to take this paper because I like nature and I spend a lot of time on computers. Put two and two together, you should get a good time, eh? But an esteemed friend of mine once told me that just because you like video games doesn't mean you like making video games. Now, nature inspired computing was all about these sort of edge theories in computing, like genetic algorithms, evolutionary computing, more neural networks, ugh, cellular automata, particle swarm optimization, fuzzy logic, and quantum computing. I really like the genetic algorithms part. They are a powerful technique that can be used to solve constrained optimization problems, like finding the best roots of a supply chain. 
The idea is to mutate a set of solutions to gradually achieve better and better fitness throughout multiple generations, with the human designers playing the role of God, modifying the evolutionary parameters of the population. Swarm optimization is also pretty useful and awesome. I focused on a type of swarm optimization applied to spacecraft in zero G as part of my big assignment. And that code is in my GitHub repo. It's called Boyd's in space. I may do a video on that later. Now, what's interesting about nature inspired computing is that the study of artificial life may shed light on configurations of possible forms of life that may exist throughout the cosmos. It is a possibility that when we make contact with extraterrestrials, that we do not meet the species itself, but instead come into contact with their creations, their left behind constructs and their autonomous spacecraft that ply the universe in search of habitable worlds and resources to collect for their creators. And let's hope that we don't appear as resources to them. So what we might mistake for life out in the universe might actually be artificial life. Now, seriously, the guy teaching this class was so badass. On the first class, Prof. Ajit Narayan started with the quote, there is room for God if you wish, but you will find that to create most of the processes that we study here, you don't need one. And his voice sounded like Liam Neeson, which I cannot imitate at this point, which is pretty badass. Uh, I did a paper, Comp 813, Artificial Intelligence, because it's the cool and in thing nowadays. And also because I was once asked on how AI would impact space exploration. And I gave an exceptionally dumb answer, and I won't let that happen again. For most lay people out there, the common misconception is that machine learning is AI, or that neural networks and deep learning is AI. Well, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Deep learning is just AI hijacked by the engineers. To truly understand artificial intelligence, you have to understand philosophy, cognitive science, psychology, and the rules of logic. Then you can talk about adding a computational aspect to it by acting on the input. And that's really what computer science people do. That's what a computer scientist does. They create discrete models of reality that can act on a given input. During this paper, I ended up spending a lot of late nights thinking about thinking. Whoa, dude, what is consciousness and intelligence and what would it mean to invent a truly intelligent AI? But 12 weeks was not enough to understand the entire history and literature of artificial intelligence going all the way back to when Alan Turing asked a computer to write for him a sonnet on the fourth bridge. I discovered this amazing concept of the epigenetic robot, a, rob a robot that is a lifelong learner with fully embodied cognition. And as of yet, humanity is still some ways away from creating a truly epigenetic robot. Maybe in some secret DARPA lab somewhere, they've got one of these things chained up for the safety of mankind. Uh, this kind of stuff is at the forefront of AI research and it involves reverse engineering the infant model of learning. It's crazy. This thing that we have within our skulls is a mechanism of near infinite potential. My feedback to Dr. Albert was that the course should be called cognitive robotics rather than artificial intelligence. And finally, I did a paper on video and image processing, Comp 820 which I really enjoyed. I have a friend who was doing a master's in video and image processing that quit midway to pursue a job in software development. We used to have long meandering conversations on the science of complex wavelet transforms. I miss those days. They'll never happen again, even though I had once regretted them. I made this solar corona tracker program using an aggregate channel features detector on ultraviolet wavelength data from NASA Solar and Heliospheric Observatory Space Satellite. Oh my gosh, that was a mouthful. The output is available on my channel, links down below. I also did a group project on generative adversarial networks for cartoonization and style transfer for images and video. Generative adversarial networks are a type of powerful neural computational architecture that relies on a pair of neural networks, a generator and a discriminator, 
playing a zero-sum game against each other to produce and generate novel artificial data with the same statistics as the training set. You can use it to generate images of fake people nearly indistinguishable from real ones. Except for your squad, they will always be the real ones. Shouts out to Basim Sabah and Osama Karem. Ah! As far as astronomical applications go, generative adversarial networks have been used to cut computation costs on simulation of dark matter distributions in the universe and to predict transient gravitational lending and to predict transient gravitational lensing events, which can be used to look for extrasolar planets, which might harbor life and intelligent civilizations. If you hadn't gotten the hint by now, I am really intrigued with the idea of finding extraterrestrials. I learned that I'm pretty comfortable with MATLAB as a prototyping platform, and I discovered where MATLAB belongs in the scientific process. MATLAB is usually used in early prototyping and design phase of scientific research. You would not typically use it in a production environment, but it's good for the exploratory design phase. On a personal level, the instructor for this course taught me that the whole point of video and image processing is to improve the diagnostic value of the video input. And I was also taught to be myself, be memorable and speak my own ideas. Preach, Dr. Boris. And that's it. That's a record of my academic experience in the past 10 months. If semester one was grounded in the reality of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, then semester two was an acid trip into deep theories of computing and machine learning. Down the rabbit hole you go. It was sort of like phase three of the Marvel movies. Woohoo, I'm a golden god. <laughs> So I did computer science for about a year and I think it's great. You come to grips with some really powerful concepts and ideas, but the only problem with it, and this is my message to everyone pursuing computer science out there, is that it's really important to maintain an active lifestyle, even despite whatever it is you're doing, whether it's machine learning or web development, you know, the things that we do, we're sitting in front of the computer all day. And it is very rewarding, actually, when these systems, these things that we build just come to life in front of us, you know, and they show us that bit of reality, whether it's in the cosmos or AI, or building an elaborate and intricate data informational system. It's great stuff. It's rewarding mentally as a challenge. But I just would like to beseech all the people who pursue this kind of line is that don't forget your physical fitness and your health. Please go out there and exercise, take a break. That's my one gripe with computer science, actually. All of these things are done in such a passive manner. You just sit down in front of the computer with your thoughts and the keyboard and the sound of the keys being typed out. I think what's lacking is more physicality. So. Dr. Boris actually has a standing desk. I recommend computer science people go out and get a standing desk. Please remember to work out and take a break when you need it. And that's it. I squared all of that off last month and I'm on holiday now doing a deep learning summer project. In the meantime, I hope to crank out more of these as a means of keeping track of my thoughts and my studies. The next few episodes will be more focused on astronomy and computational astrophysics. Like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps the channel. Hit that notification button to stay tuned for more. Thanks for listening, and I will see you next time. Okay.